100% success rate, gets pitched at many, many shows. Is it ethical? Is it viable? And is it part of the moral experience when coming over on your first safari to Africa? Join us as we dive in to this latest topic. Welcome to the PH Journals podcast, where we explore hunting, wildlife management, and conservation. As hunters and conservationists, we know that hunting can be a powerful tool for wildlife conservation, generating revenue and promoting healthy ecosystems. Join us as we explore the latest research, interviewing experts and practitioners, and sharing stories from the field. Whether you're a hunter, or conservationist, or simply interested in learning more about this somewhat controversial topic. Hi, my name is Dylan Love. I'm a professional hunter out of the southern tip of the dark continent. Join us, as I believe hunting is our best conservation tool we have to offer. Hey guys, and welcome yet again to another beautiful day here in South Africa, as well as a stunning way to end the week off by doing a podcast. Um, those of you that don't know me, my name is Dylan Love. I'm a professional hunter out of South Africa and Africa alike. And I think it's safe to say that welcome and you've joined probably the number one podcast in South Africa with over 1.5 million, no, 1.15 million downloads. It's been an absolute honor to share my story with you guys across the board. Thank you to everyone that has supported me. If you haven't yet, I would really appreciate if you are watching this on YouTube to drop a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications as every little bit counts. And if you guys are listening to this on any one of my other social media platforms, please, I would really appreciate it if you could share this across and just make well aware that people can go and listen to a podcast and a journey of a professional hunter. Cool guys. So yeah. The question gets asked a lot of the time, am I capable of completing my package when I come out on my next safari? This is somewhat, for me personally, a controversial topic, um, as people always ask, what is my percentage? What are, what are my chances of getting what I want um, in my safari package? Coming out to South Africa, um, it's a tricky one to answer, and over the years, it's kind of put itself in a little bit of hot water. However, it does get thrown around at these hunting shows. And although I kind of think that it gets frowned upon, at the same time, I think it's it's a really great way. It's a, it's a great sales topic for somebody that's invested pretty much their life savings into a safari and an experience that they would never want to forget. But at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's about the experience and not actually how many animals you get to take on your next safari. It's it's an interesting one for me. And a couple of questions get asked. Should a hunter um, home their skills and their equipment so they, they can expect a 100% success rate? Those of you that have followed me on this journey and, and understand the South African bushfold will understand that equipment now has become increasingly important for a higher success rate on any safari. So spending the time, spending the money on really good gear is always advised so that you guys can come out and have your best chance of harvesting or, or getting the package that you guys have so dearly put your hard earned money into. Um, should a hun hunter seek to improve their skills um, to the point that they can guarantee 100% success rate when they go out hunting? And this, you know, for me, is crucially important because as a bow hunter, there's been probably most of my hunts are less than 50% successful. And what this means is that there's always room for me to improve. So... Asking yourself the question, if I come out here and it, and it does seem a kind of too easy to be true situation, you got to ask yourself the question, is it really? Taking your surroundings and understand. But what does, this, what, does, what does this mean for an outfitter? Are we doing the best we possibly can to make sure that these experiences are shared across the board ethically? 
because let's face it let's and let's be honest with the topic let's be honest with the situation that a lot of institutions in south africa or a lot of properties and companies in within south africa do hunt out of small acreage and because the increasing the increasing growing in outfitters so too does the properties and the camps as you would call it actually get a little bit smaller and compact the other problem that comes into into play is these color variants not a lot of people would really understand and and um acknowledge the fact that having color variants would mean that you would have to separate herds of animals so that the color variants stay pure and they don't get lost in the genetic pool um, through breeding and, and crossbreeding. So all these questions have to be asked. Are we giving the best experience possible for the hunter coming out and spending his hard earned money over here? Or are we adding to the problem by doing what we are doing at the moment? Hence, the question gets asked. How often am I going to have a 100% success rate? And I think, guys, I think we need to ask ourselves a lot of important questions around this. Is that, is being, and I really, this topic kind of opens its, itself up for conversation. And maybe I'll post it on my social media as well. Because at the end of the day, what is the client actually looking for? Is he coming out here to make sure that he's experiencing 100% success rate on his package? Or is he coming out here for the experience? And I think if you're a true hunter and you understand the industry and where it's going, and you really want to play your a part, an important part in the circle of life, I think understanding that getting out here and enjoying the experience more so than actually just killing animals is more of the important aspect here. And by enjoying the experience, not only do you give back into the communities that need, but you promote a healthy and ethical way of hunting, which is good at the end of the day, if we're trying to promote this industry as a conservation tool. So, you know, we have to ask ourselves these hard questions. And unfortunately, there's a lot of us out there, and I say us, and I mean unethical outfitters out there, that believe in in generating money over experience and they don't understand the concept that it's possible to have both that if you're going to give your clients a good experience you're going to get paid well as well and i and i think i speak for the clients on on this behalf because i've been in this industry for a little over 14 years and the more conversations i've had with individuals it's not always about killing the animal at the end of the day. I mean, we I've had bow hunters that have shot one animal on a 10-day safari and had an absolute blast because not only were we trapped in the middle of a, of a Cape Buffalo herd or stalked four hours for a zebra crawling on our hands and knees, uh, getting cactuses in our asses and all that sort of stuff, it the whole the full experience in indulging in cultures food and and personalities was all part of that so why advertise a hundred percent success rate if that is not an ethical way to promote this industry because let's face it if we are really going to call ourselves hunters I, I've, I've been a hunter since the age of 13 and i can tell you now i've probably myself only shot between five and six species of animals and my beautiful countries is riddled with completely different species and the fact of the matter is is that i don't want to go out there and just pull the trigger willy-nilly i want to have an experience and i want to be part of the conservation programs that we believe will benefit these animals so once again asking the question does a hundred percent success rate promote your business in an ethical way? And I think the question is getting asked a lot more. Why would you guarantee a hundred percent, hundred percent success rate? Excuse me. And again, you know, as a hunter, you know, as 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 outfitters, we've got to ask ourselves. Yeah, sure. There's a lot of us out there that can that can provide a hundred percent success rate but what what are the sacrifices that we are going to be doing 
to our current situation are we making the camp smaller um are we you know we buying abundance of animals that are, are unviably unsustainable for that particular land uh, with the overgrazing and you know that sort of stuff but you 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 kind of kind of becomes like a like a retail store because you you're overstocking the land and you know it's not sustainable for that land but you know you can possibly shoot that quota out it's a very it's a very risky and um delicate process if we as hunters are going to promote conservation efforts so ask yourself that and then as a hunter you've got to ask yourself am i going to be a part of the problem if i expect a hundred percent success rate when coming out here am i going to be part of the problem and you need to ask yourself that question honestly so yeah it's important and you know what are the implications if it's not a hundred percent like what if the what are the implications if you come out here and you don't get what you want are you going to go back and be sour about it or does this afford you the opportunity to come back to africa and harvest or, or hunt the animal that you have based your whole life on of course there are situations where individuals are getting nearer to the end of life and their opportunity hasn't come on beforehand and now it's their once in a lifetime opportunity of course you want your professional hunter and your outfitter to give them the best possible chance um there is but it's still should we still call it 100 percent? because if we are for instance if this individual is saved up his whole life savings to hunt a cape buffalo and he's 89 years old he won't be able to fly again comes out here the professional hunter and, and, and outfitter bust their asses off trying to get this individual his dream cape buffalo. Is it still going to be 100%? How would you say it? 100% success rate? I highly doubt it if it's an ethical hunt. There's always that risk factor of not only that animal getting away, but charging you is the danger. It's It's all that sort of stuff. I mean... You know, you look at individuals that have done so well. Um, you know, there's a, there's a very good friend of mine, and I had the privilege and honor to meet this gentleman through through hunting. And he actually got me into bow hunting, and for that I'll be ever grateful. And I, I hope our paths cross someday soon. But Uncle Will Nelson, he um, is probably, if not one of the most successful bow hunters I've ever met. But just his output on life is just is thrilling. He's come out to South Africa probably 20 times at least. At least it could be more. could be way more. But still never got every single species South Africa has to offer. And we're forever looking for different opportunities, especially with a bow. You know, species such as Blue Darker, uh, Cape Graceback, Oruby, that sort of stuff. It's, in, it's intensely difficult. It really, really is. But he understands that. And he understands that this is, although it's not 100% secured, it gives him the opportunity to come back if he misses his opportunity now. So, yeah, you know, that you've got to admire because that's an individual that really embraces the true characteristics and, and ethics us as hunters should all stand for. And that's believing that being a part of the conservation efforts is the best chance we have for this to all work itself out. But if we're not, and if we're going to throw our toys out of the cot because we're not going to complete packages and all that sort of stuff, it's really going to leave a negative impact on the industry and put a lot of unnecessary pressure on your outfitter, on your professional hunter, and they're going to go to the ultimate extremes to try and make your next hunt as successful as possible which will mean nine times out of 10 doing unethical things. And that's not what we should stand for. So those are a couple of questions and conversation tools that I think we all need to have. And I, th I think it's a great idea that I put this on um, social media. And I would love I would love as much interaction as possible. Um, <clears throat> so it just goes to say, should... I, as a hunter, professional hunter, or even an outfitter, expect a 100% rate. No, I doubt it. We shouldn't. Um, 
does half fence hunting guarantee a hundred percent six success rate? Um, this is an interesting one. I mean, we've had conversations on this podcast about half fence and fair chase. And I don't think half fence um, does guarantee a hundred percent success rate because you do still get jumpers and you still get animals that can get underneath and lift their noses. And there's 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 big enough properties out there to um, back the statement up. However, however, like mentioned before, because of all the different aspects that safari companies have got to entail over the past couple of years, like I mentioned, with color variants, um, size all that sort of stuff it's led to a lot of game farms if they own ten thousand acres breaking it down into smaller camps so the color variants don't get mixed up or the larger animals genes don't get mixed up with the smaller animals so it's just it's just a vicious circle if that's the way things are however there are individuals out there that have got large sums of property and are doing things naturally in the correct way yes of course we all understand that keeping your golden wildebeest away from your blue wildebeest is highly advised um and thanks to our south african <laughs> wonderful gentlemen at um environmental affairs believe that crossbreeding of black wildebeest and blue wildebeest i've never seen it personally and i haven't seen any proof or evidence that it actually happens believe that we need to keep these animals separated although they've been roaming these lands for generations and years and years and years together they believe we've got to separate them so now you're finding individuals having smaller camps um, or grasslands separated for these specific animals so you're kind of in this weird transition now because as an outfitter you've got to balance all these things up but at the same time keep your property large enough for this to all be ethical and make sense at the end of the day and be an ethical hunt and experience um <clears throat> could a hunter or ph or outfitter's knowledge of their quarry and hunting area guarantee a hundred percent success rate in a free range area no this can't it can't guarantee any hundred percent although a lot, a lot of animals, just like the our fellow North American individuals, where a lot of the um, game paths can be picked up, whether it be from, you know, travel to and from water, um, or in the rat season, you'll often find big bulls moving across. And you will be able to pick on different breeding patterns and um, paths walked. So it, it does make it a little bit easier that way. But at the same time, it doesn't give you a 100% success rate. Things could change. The weather could change. Uh, could veer off course. You've got the, the factors of um, full moon. Uh, when at what time of the day are the animals working? However... I do recommend that outfitters and PHs do do their homework when it comes to certain times of the year. For instance, the rat for the fellow deer is coming up now. And I'm going to go and put in a lot of extra work, put our trail cameras, um, make sure that I'm understanding the, um, the aspect of the landscape and how these animals are traveling to and from. Does this add to the success rate? No, it doesn't. Um, and neither, neither do I think that baiting adds to the success rate as well because for instance our blue darker we don't bait but we put out water water holes um during the hot warmer seasons and we put up trail cameras and you can track um the pairs coming in and out and it still doesn't it still doesn't leave you with a hundred percent chance of getting that animal because like i said the patterns could always change it could be something that could veer the pattern off whether it be two days bedding down because of the wind or rain weather conditions um or just simply moving in and out uh, more frequently when it gets to the cooler months because they don't want to sit around and f they want to feed more and make sure that they prepare themselves body wise for winter or the rat coming up so these things are, are all important as far as preparation is concerned for, for a professional hunter, for an outfitter as well, but still doesn't guarantee a 100% success rate. So what can you do 
as an individual to make sure that when you pitch these ideas to clients, that they need to understand firstly that nothing's 100% guaranteed unless you are shooting in enclosures less than three or four acres and half fenced. Give the individual, give the hunter tasks to go back, make sure that they're practicing at the range on the regular basis. They're buying the best equipment they possibly can afford to make sure that their, their safari is the best possibly received safari as they can have. Um, and yes, there are a lot of safaris. And I would say majority of the safaris out there that you go to are always going to land up being a 100% success rate. However, if they're not, I do find it's a lot more accepting from individuals that have had a, a better, great experience than they have by completing a package. What does this mean from an outfitter's perspective and why they would encourage a hundred percent success rate is because number one, it's a great sales point. Uh, those hunters coming out here believe that, excuse me, <clears throat> they believe that their money is safe, that they're going to get what they paid for. However, I know there are more than the fair share of outfitters there that if the package is not completed, they will reimburse those hunters. Um, but at the same time, a hunter does get a little bit nervous because they're not sure when they will be coming back. But at the same time, that being said, a lot of hunters will also, once they arrive on safari, change out a lot of their species according to the different times of year um, or the different availabilities of, of certain animals and species within herds. Um, because at the end of the day, remember guys, we're conservationists, we're looking after these herds. So if there aren't enough old animals to take out, we shouldn't want to have to push the number and just shoot for the sake of shooting. We should want to control those herds in an ethical and moral way so that for future generations to come and enjoy. And if it means that the hunter is not going to get it that, that year round, then he must come back in the next year or the year after that. Once you've been to Africa once, you fall in love with it and you're going to keep wanting to come back. And at this point, America sits pretty as a rand dollar exchange rate. So it's it's very encouraging for them to come back. But at the same time, we've just got to be aware of, of the impact that you guys can have on this. Not fake, but somewhat man-created ecosystem. And we've got to look after that. We've got to preserve and conserve it right now. So... Yeah, interesting things ahead for the future. Um, once again, if the question gets asked, what are my chances? Don't sell 100%. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, it's not what I think is the right way to be done. Um, but that's, again, these are all just my personal opinions. And it's not what I want the industry to fall into that trap for. Is it a sales gimmick? Possibly. Does it make a difference? I personally don't believe it. Um, the clients are just wanting to have a really, really good time and experience. So sell the experience and leave this percentage. Leave worrying about this percentage. Um, essentially, when does the seeking 100% success rate become unsporting? And when um, should hunters limit themselves to make hunting sporting? <sighs> Like mentioned, I think it becomes unsporting when you're hunting in less than a two acre camp and you know exactly what's happening. When should hunters limit themselves to make hunting sporting? I guess that's an important question and I guess this can be answered in so many ways. But one that comes to mind straight away for me is that understand when you step in the field it's about conservation looking after the herd you are after and if you get there and there's not an ethical animal and what i mean by ethical animal i mean old um past its prime doesn't want to breed again um or on the other spectrum if there's too many make sure that you know they're not breeding stock they can't they're not pregnant or anything like that <laughs> excuse me hone in on that and embrace that because ultimately that's what's going to be the difference between whether it's ethical or not 
So if you get there, and unfortunately the herd, there's no ethical animals to take or moral animals to take out of there, and you've got to leave it for a next season or season or two seasons time, then do so. Be the better man. Stand up for what you believe is right for conservation. And a lot of hunters will respect you for that because you're not chasing trophies. You're chasing conservation, which is important if we want to keep this industry alive and keep guys like me having jobs. And for me, that's an incredible part of this wonderful ecosystem that unfortunately we've created. But we've got to look after it now. So that's an important part. So guys, around this topic, there's there's a lot that can be discussed. There's a lot that can be taken in. And I believe that if you're using this as a sales tool, I think get it out of your head or get it out of your sales pitch as soon as possible because not only does it leave a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, but it's not really what most clients are after. They're not worried about the 100% success rate. They're more after the experience. So guarantee them 100% great experience. And that way you guys can move forward in an industry that is somewhat controversial. And we need to stick together because if we turn this around and we've got every Tom, Dick and Harry pitching their ideas that this is going to be 100% success rate, building smaller enclosures to provide um, because you've pitched it now, so to, to supplement your promise that you've made at these shows, well, then we're just adding bigger issues to the problem. And it's only, it's a matter of time before this massive, big, hot air balloon explodes in our face. And if we as hunters aren't going to stick together and make sure that we can cool this thing down together, it's never going to work. And we're just going to con- just carry on being a controversial topic in, in this fight against our wildlife conservation. And I think I think it's an honest question that we need to all ask ourselves. Not only as a, not only as a professional hunter, not only as an outfitter, but as a guest, as a hunter coming into this magnificent country. Because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. But it's greed, it's money, and it's selfishness that gets in the way of this. And if the sooner we can put that all aside and understand this is for the greater good, the sooner we can fight this battle together and understand that pitching ideas as 100% success rate is not the best idea there is. So guys, I know this is a short podcast. Um, It is a question that's been circulating on social media. Um, forums like huntingafrica.com i've picked up a lot of topics about this and stuff so i just wanted to voice my opinion um like i said i'm very very passionate about the situation that's going on at the moment and i believe as a hunter as a fellow hunter i need to make people aware of what's actually going on but at the same time not disencourage them more encourage them to come over and experience this wonderful landscape we have to offer So guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's uh, topic. And yeah, I've had so much fun. Once again, a big shout out, massive shout out to the the team at Scully's. If you guys haven't yet, the description will be down below and use PHJ10 for 10% discount on any Scully's product product (laughs) in the Scully's store. Yeah, just I can't thank the team at Scully's enough for backing me and supporting me on this project. Um, It's been a wonderful time. I'm going to be spending a whole week with them this week coming, and I'm really, really looking forward to that. Um, So, yeah, guys, if you guys have got any other topics that you would like to discuss on this podcast, or if you would like to be a guest, hit me up on any one of my social media platforms and let's make it happen. At this point in time, um, I'm thoroughly enjoying what I'm doing and sharing my story with you guys. And hopefully this makes somewhat of a difference in our wonderful industry that I believe hunting is our best conservation tool to offer. So from myself and the whole PH Journals team, thank you so much for tuning in. And if you are, happy hunting. Until then, stay safe, stay blessed, stay humble. We'll catch up with you guys soon. Cheers for now. The Journal is brought to you by Treason. Don't just blend, become Splitting Image Taxidermy, worth remembering. Maxis Tires, covering pHs over any terrain. Magnum Archery, Scully's, the little things are what makes life wonderful. 
Vanandi Blends, changing the game. FFS Outdoor, versatile gear for any situation. PH Toolbox, helping you make your own adventure.